je weer kijkt naar een nieuwe aflevering van Meet the Pro. En in deze aflevering hebben we al een hele speciale en bekende gast. Uh, hij is uh, filmmaker, documentaire filmmaker en fotojournalist. Ik heb het over niemand minder dan Joel Santos. Hij komt uit Portugal, dus we schakelen direct over naar het Engels. Hi, Joel. Hallo, Willemijn. How are you doing? How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. And you? <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, can you maybe present yourself? Because there may be some viewers that don't know you yet. Okay, so my name is Joel Santos. I'm a photojournalist and a documentary filmmaker. I tend to specialize in remote regions of our world because I like to, you know, document fading traditions and, and also raw nature. So I love to go to volcanic uh, areas and be in touch with the uh, erupting volcanoes and with lava. So that's my, my passion, actually. But besides that, I also write books. Uh, I, I publish into magazines. So I don't really know what's my job because I have plenty of them. <laughs> You do a lot of nice stuff, right? So, um, can you maybe tell us uh, how you cope with this uh, current situation? Yeah, so it's been hard for everybody. Uh, and uh, and uh, I was working actually in India. I was shooting a documentary there for, for a TV channel here in Portugal. When suddenly I was shooting a time lapse on a rooftop when we got this notice that all visas would be cancelled. And so if there's no planes coming into India, we wouldn't have uh, also flight back to Portugal. So I had to escape. And when I got here, uh, I had to fulfill quarantine because I was with uh, plenty of people. So thousands of people during religious ceremonies in, in Varanasi, for example. So yeah, I had to fulfill the, this quarantine. And again, overnight, uh, the reality had changed for me. So I could no longer travel, which is what I do. I could no longer teach here in our classroom uh, because we couldn't be uh, uh, with people. So I had to actually reinvent myself, not only uh, what I want to shoot, but how could I teach uh, uh, people photography d during this workshop. So I used uh, Skype like you're using now and uh, Zoom so I could be still be in touch with, uh, with, my, with my students, but also uh, give them some inspirational videos about something that they could do uh, at home because when I start photographing back in 2003, nice. Uh, uh, I was finishing my master thesis, so I was stuck at home between my bed and the fridge, you know. So I only had as a main subject uh, tap water. So I did a video about how to make incredible photos just using uh, tap water. And that resonated a lot with my, with my viewers, which was incredible, actually. Wow, nice. Um, tell us, uh, have you been to Holland or the, Netherla the Netherlands, I should say? Uh, yes, I've been quite a few times to the Netherlands. Uh, first time I was really a young boy, maybe six years old. Uh, my father loved to drive long distances, so we would start in Lisbon and end up in Germany and then uh, go to the Netherlands. But most recently, I had this really, really kind invitation from Canada, Netherlands. So I was there to, um, to attend the Canada Talks live show and also to record the podcast. Uh, and I believe that people can still uh, uh, look into it uh, if you provide the link somehow to them. Uh, I think it was an yeah. amazing production. And I regard, you know, Canon Holland and you guys at Camera Express like uh, my family. So thank you very much for that invitation back then and also uh, oh, thank you very much. We'll make sure we, we put the link in the description uh, below the video. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> we'll be okay. Okay, good. Uh, let's go to the first part of this interview and that's called the most recent photo of Joel. We gaan naar de laatste foto van Joel Santos. The most recent photo of Joel and actually um, you picked uh, two series, right? Yes, so about my recent photos, they are actually not a single photo, but a series of photos. And uh, the, the first of them is about, uh, you know, this situation in, 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 with the COVID crisis, you know. And so uh, Lisbon is a very uh, touristic place nowadays. It's, uh, I believe, the third most visited capital in Europe after London and Paris. And so it was absolutely weird. Uh, to witness Lisbon without a single soul, you know, uh, walking in the streets, yeah, not a yeah, single yeah. car. Uh, we have two big bridges crossing the river, so empty. Um, and so I felt the need to go outside 
and just document that as well. And, but I needed people to understand it was a real uh, photo, not a long exposure where you can you know, blur people out of the frame or even um, with the kind of light that I usually I don't use because uh, I usually tend to shoot uh, really early or really late in the, in the day. So I wanted to be mm -hmm. really daytime so people understand it was not because people were sleeping back at home but actually uh, not being able to during the state of emergency to be outside their homes so for that i used actually uh, drone shots uh, because with the drone shot you cannot make a long exposure um, and i went to the most iconic places in lisbon like uh, one of the bridges some of our main squares uh, and as you can see through the photos uh, you will not see anybody. Sometimes you would see a spot a car because you know transport public transportation never fully stopped. So you, you would see mm -hmm. like one car, two cars at most, but anybody, you know, not a single soul was walking on the street. So I hope we yeah. never experience this again. Uh, but I see photos as a kind of a, you know, a book, like a repository of knowledge and information. Uh, and yeah. those photos, I believe, would be uh, really valuable uh, in the future. So we can uh, show these to next, uh, the following generations, and they can witness what we have experienced uh, uh, during the 2020, you know. Uh, so, yeah, that is one of the series. And uh, the, the second series is uh, from one of my latest um, uh, self-fund assignments, because most of my assignments... Uh, are decided by me so uh, I try to pursue uh, stories that I really love uh, that I really think uh, would be uh, really interesting to shoot and so I went to South Sudan uh, it's not a safe country at all uh, it's a very problematic country uh, but I like I like and I love those kind of uh, you know uh, situations uh, where we can have access still to very pristine um, ways of living and so uh, I, I had yeah. the chance to be uh, with uh, several tribes one of them the Mundari which somehow are already um, known to people but I wanted to not only shoot photographs so stills in a more uh, you know intimate way than I used to see but also shoot uh, video uh, in a way I would never seen before so I wanted to take these latest uh, cameras and lenses and try to bring, you know, the, the aesthetics that I usually uh, tend to uh, to have in my photographs, and bring it into the video. So I, I cannot share with you right now, uh, uh, you know, that footage because it will be released as a documentary uh, in the last semester, uh, last trimester. I'm sorry, of 2020. Yes. But the, the, the <laughs> photos, uh, yes, I can share with you, uh, and 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 yeah. and I believe they show a really, um, you know. What puzzles me about people around the world is uh, how do they find happiness? Uh, because that's also a, like a personal pursuit for me, what makes me happy. And so I, I love witnessing tribes because of course our realities are absolutely different. Uh, and, and so I try to understand what makes them happy, how they survive, how they cope uh, with problems. And also because we can only live the present and move towards the future, when you living together with the tribe, you can actually travel back in time. So you can see yourself as you were in the past when we were all nomads, where we all somehow were cattle herders. And it's beautiful yeah. to see that way of living and witnessing that before Absolutely. it uh, fades away with the evolution and with uh -huh. development. Yeah, yeah, correct. I, I, I love, love both series actually. Um, yeah, I, when I saw when I saw one of the fir the first pictures of, of that series of uh, South Sudan, I was like, whoa, <laughs> it's kind of a dreamy, mysterious, uh, mysterious uh, setup actually. It's uh, it's lovely, and then the, the the drone photos of Particle are actually, um, in my opinion, are are art. It's it, there are so many patterns you see. It's uh, yeah, it's nice. You're there are so kind. many details. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. So, um, thank you for sharing. We're going to the uh, round of questions number one. We gaan naar vragenronde nummer één.
Round of questions number one, Joel. Okay. Uh, the first question is from uh, Rijk Arns, and he's asking, how did you start with travel photography and documentaries, and how did you find your customers? How do you find your customers? Okay, so um, as I've told you before, uh, uh, in 2004, uh, 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 you know, my background is actually not being a photographer, so I was an economist, and so I was sent to East Timor to teach uh, at university in Dili. So that experience uh, allowed me to actually be in touch with a very different reality from my own. Uh, and so that's when it all started because uh, although I was there to teach, uh, I was confronted with this uh, diversity of people and situations. And at the same time, because I'm very allergic to uh, anti-malarian pills, so I, could, I can't take them. So actually, I had to stop uh, shooting uh, landscapes like I, I, I did like back then to shoot and just traveling to the mountains and be with, uh, with the local people. So I would sleep under trees. Uh, I would travel like 14 hours straight just to be with them and to learn their ways and, uh, and how to earn their, their trust. Because you know, it has been a country that was uh, invaded during uh, 25 years. So people were still very scared about, you know, some foreigners, especially ones holding something, you know, like a camera. Um, and so actually I found out how much I loved to, to, to be with people, to learn their ways and to experience their culture. But at the same time, East Timor uh, is part of the Ring of Fire. So uh, I traveled a lot to Indonesia. I've been probably 17, 18 times uh, in Indonesia. And so uh, uh, I know I got in touch with, uh, with the volcanic landscapes more than I did in Portugal because uh, we do have volcanic islands. So the Azores and the Madeira, mm -hmm. they are volcanic, but not too active and but in Indonesia they are active so actually I felt you know the adrenaline and the passion for uh, being next to active uh, volcanoes and to shoot them so that together with uh, the you know the knowledge coming from my parents because they were very you know uh, addicted to traveling I, I started traveling I wasn't even one year old you know uh, I would be camping I would be camping. Uh, my parents never gave up. They were very young, so they were about uh, 19 and 20 when I was born. Uh, so oh, that's they, young, they, yeah. Yeah, very young. So they did everything they should do at, with people at that age. And I was just like a friend, you know, not a child, not a son, but a friend. And so I love that relationship that we have. And actually, they put me into all these adventures. And my father, mostly, uh, he was uh, very uh, keen to photograph. So I was his favorite model. I would suffer a lot, you know. I was put <laughs> into ridges, uh, uh, cliffs, uh, bridges, uh, everything. So actually, somehow that DNA uh, got imprinted uh, into me. So when I these so, uh, yeah. circumstances uh, met together, uh, yeah, I just uh, knew that uh, I would love not being an economist, but someone who would uh, travel uh, and, uh, and try to find more about stuff around the world. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and so the, the second part of the question was, how do you find your customers? Okay, so uh, I should, uh, as maybe somehow I, I, I did explain for personal reasons. Uh, so. I never, I didn't start in photography to earn money or to be known or something like that. And I still do not operate that way. So I never take a photograph thinking uh, this would be a nice cover or that client would love to see this kind of work. Uh, so uh, most of the time uh, uh, clients come to me, uh, which is very good uh, because it's um, somehow is uh, uh, it's, um, it's something that makes me happy that it happens that way because it allows me to be still up today after 17 years working uh, as a photographer and also filmmaker. People coming to me because they like what they see, they like what I, they do. And so it's, um, it's, it's actually very good. Uh, it works out that way. Um, so 95% of my time I embark in my own projects. And after I finish them, uh, I tend to show them uh, to either to magazine or to TV stations and, and so on. But uh, it, it's, there's no short, shortcut. So it, it happens step by step. 
even uh, with the writing the books also step by step. Uh, but most mm -hmm. of the times, I would say 90% of the times, uh, clients uh, come to me and not the other way around. So, uh, and I'm very happy about that. That's very handy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Costs a lot of time, I guess, to, to find customers. So. Uh... Yeah, yeah, uh, it, it, it does. It's very, it's very demanding. And, and you know, uh, um, I'm very demanding about myself and I'm a very impatient person. Uh, in, 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 when I really want to do something, I must do it. So for me, waiting for someone to sponsor me or to back up me or something like that, uh, it, it, it would take too long to me. So actually I try yeah. and I, I believe that my past as an economist helps me a lot because I'm very thorough planning, planner and I plan everything uh, financially very, you know, uh, in a way that works because uh, um, as you know, photographers are not rich people, so they have to think really <laughs> carefully about every step they take because everything we do is a risk, you know, physical risk, uh, 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 financial risk. So, uh, but I also, in a way, like that because everything I do comes out of me. Uh, uh, and so there's value to that, I believe. Super. Um, we go to the second question. It's from Tamara Dangerman, and she's asking, what are your sources of inspiration? Uh, well, I don't have heroes, so to say, but uh, definitely my father uh, is a source of inspiration because, uh, you know, he, he, he taught me how to use a computer when I was four. He introduced me to photography when I was five, although I was a lousy, lousy photographer. So the first camera he gave me, I just uh, uh, put it inside a, a natural pool. So I ruined the camera on the first five minutes. So big disaster. Uh, yeah, but but because I was <laughs> because I was his favorite model, uh, so I got in touch with a lot of photography because of him. And I have all natural geographic issues since I was born. So. In a way, I was born into photography and also into computers. And as you know, computers also have, you have to, you know, to create a world. So you have to be picky about a color composition. And before it was very demanding to program games. And my father also programmed games and, and other kinds of software. So I learned how to, you know, to look at stuff and think about, the, about it and use it. So. He's my yes. main, main source of inspiration, but also Steve McCurry. That's beautiful. Uh, yeah. Because I love the way he uh, works with color. As you know, most of my work is uh, color. I find shooting in color much harder than shooting in black and white because uh, color can add, you know, uh, plenty of distractions. So you have to be careful about that. And because also Steve mm -hmm. McCurry was the first to shoot some kind of situations. And I also try to be that person. I don't like to, uh, you know, shoot things that are, have already been shot or documented. So I value that a lot. And also he's very picky about composition and light. And I see myself that way as well. So, uh, yeah, I would say my father definitely and Steve McCurry. Okay, wow, cool. Um, uh, question number three, when you run into a child or an adult on your trip that you'd like to photograph, uh, do you always ask permission before you take a picture? It's from Marel Zets Bay. Well, I actually have two kinds of approaches. Either I take a photo without people noticing I'm taking a photo, but one thing that I never do is running away from them. So. 99% uh, of my photos that I take pe with people not knowing, uh, I will always uh, show the photo to them because I don't want just another stamp, so to say, to my collection. I want a photo with a story. So I need to learn about people behind the photo. And actually, photos are uh, universal language. Uh, so with photos, even you don't speak the same language, with a photo, when you show a photo, actually you can communicate uh, with, with people. So I also see uh, yes. that opportunity as a means to actually communicate with people. And most of the times, so I would say more often than not, me showing the photo allows me into their lives so I can get into their lives and sometimes meet their parents and their friends. And so, and the story starts to build up. So my really, 
you know, advice to people that like to shoot uh, people and document people is just uh, go there and talk with people, even you, if you're trying to be unnoticed. And I also do this in very dangerous countries as well. So I always tend to show people the photos I took. And if uh, they somehow ask me to delete a photo, most of the times I will respect that because I believe when you're dealing with people, most of all, you have to respect them. So imagine if someone from India would come to my doorstep and start shooting photos in my face. I would love uh, him to be or her to be respectful of who I am, who I, where I am. So of course, I yeah. try to be that person all the times. The second approach, of course, would be spend time. And, and uh, I can spend minutes, hours, even days, even weeks with the community until I can earn uh, their trust. Uh, and I'm not seen anymore as a foreigner, but as someone that is part of their daily lives. And so I'm invisible. Yeah, yeah I'm invisible to them. So, uh, and I have plenty of work done uh, this way. So you have to, if you really want to go deeper, if you really want to take a different approach to your story, if you want really to be original and not be kind of social media kind of uh, documentary person, uh, you need to invest time with people because people deserve your time uh, because you're taking something out of them. So you should also give back something to them and giving your time, believe it or not, sometimes is the most precious thing, giving them attention, uh, showing them how important right. they are uh, to you. Yeah, nice. Um, uh, I got an extra question, actually a question of my own. Um, how do you get your information to start a documentary or a photo series? I mean, like you have to do some research. Do you work together with an anthropologist or uh, or a translator or? Yeah, so it depends on the destination. Uh, uh, three quick examples. For uh, uh, when I went first time to Mongolia uh, to document uh, for the very first time the nomad uh, migration of the Kazakhs. So I did that uh, and another guy from BBC as well. So we, we went in different uh, times of the year so, and I did that in 2015. But actually the dream to visit Mongolia <laughs> uh, came to my head in 1998. So sometimes imagine it can take, uh, it can take as you've seen, uh, 17 years to accomplish a dream because I was flying actually a KLM flight. So I had a stopover in Amsterdam and I was, you know, very nervous about that, uh, you know, that trip. So I was very excited and I went to the window and I saw these beautiful mountains and I saw in the screen Ulaanbaatar and I said, wow, someday yeah. I have to come to Mongolia. And in 2015, it all came together. So I found out about uh, a fixer that could uh, help me, you know, to organize, to, you know, have a power generator, to have a all-terrain vehicle because I really wanted to go deep, deep, deep inside into the mountains. I didn't want, to, right. I want a yeah. family that have never, have never had been in touch with a foreigner. So I wanted that. So yeah, it takes a lot of time, emails, uh, research, uh, getting the right connections until you get to the place you want. And sometimes like that situation, I ended up there without any certainty that I would accomplish uh, uh, my goal. Uh, but I did, and I had to travel like five days doing 30 to 40 kilometers per day walking through the mountains wow. with one to two liters of water per day, so severe <laughs> dehydration. Um, it's a wonder you're still alive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but this kind of um, assignments also teach you. Uh, you know, I was there to photograph, but by, at the end of the day, I just wanted to, you know, go from point A to point B alive. <laughs> so that's pure simplicity yeah. in our lives. So, yeah, so that's one way of planning uh, 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 a trip. It can take uh, weeks or even months and sometimes years in your head, just building, building, building until the right time comes uh, to do that. And sometimes it's just random, you know, you meet someone uh, in a very remote place and you talk to them and sometimes they tell you something about uh, a, a tradition, something about, um, you know, uh, completely unknown. 
and then you get you stumble into that story. For example, I was in uh, Ghana to um, to document uh, people that still up to date children that are used as slaves uh, uh, for working in a lake. So I was shooting that story, but because of that story, I found this uh, unknown fisherman community that they, they fish in a in a lake that was created by a meteor impact some million years ago. So they oh. feel that lake not as a lake but as a entity so they feel their the energy coming from the lake so they cannot touch the water with metal and i found that amazing so, you know i came from a country uh with um, a tradition of fishing and so i spent three days until they allowed me to shoot uh that so but i was not expecting even to shoot that story so i stumbled into the story so you have to keep your senses open, your eyes open, uh, because you never know when the next unknown story will present itself to you. But you have to be, you know, I don't believe in luck. I, I believe in being prepared, you know, and life is like a movie. And, you know, the frames are passing through your eyes. But if you're ready, if you're prepared, you can grab them. And so that's, uh, that's how I see life, actually. Oh, nice. You should be a life coach as well. Uh, <laughs> You're being too nice, Wilmin. <laughs> uh, let's go to the next round. It's yeah. portfolio photo number one. We gaan naar portfolio photo number één. So, portfolio photo number one is from Olaf Leisinga. What did you think about this photo? Well, first of all, thank you very much for sharing your photos with me because you trust me. So, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this photo is a very beautiful photo. Uh, I, I love backlit scenes, so I like the way the sun is peeking uh, behind the window. The exposure is very well uh, achieved, very well thought. thought. Uh, also, I love the mix uh, between warm tones and cold tones. Uh, I, I actually love that. I try to use that as much as I can also in my work. Um, also the mood, the mood is very nice with the, with the soft haze uh, on, the, on, the, um, on the land, so it's very beautiful. And also, of course, the, you know, have like the counterweight to the tree is the, the windmill. So I actually uh, really love this, this photo, it's very uh, striking image. Uh, I would love to have it uh, in my home, you know, hanging in the <laughs> wall, so that says a lot about the photo. Um, composition wise, I also like it. Although I believe the windmill at the right side is a little bit too tight, so maybe a little bit too close to the edge of the, of the frame. Uh, it's just a yeah. picky detail, but I'm very picky about, uh, you know, details. Very hard, you know, uh, I, I'm very demanding with myself, so, uh, but yeah, but all in all, uh, I... You can always improve yourself, right? That's why we, are, we want to receive feedback. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, you know, some, sometimes <laughs> the photos that are truly loved today, I go to bed, you know, thinking, oh, I love this photo. The next day I wake up thinking, oh, I should have done better. It happens all the time with, with me. Yeah, I'm like that. <laughs> I'm, I'm a very, very unsatisfied guy with, uh, with what I do, you know, which troubles a lot my mother because <laughs> I, I, I see... She asked me, how many photos do you like from those you've done until today? I say, about five, maybe. So, and uh, my, my, my mother finds it very puzzling. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, well, um, in general, you just uh, love this picture as uh, there's a good balance between like everything you yeah, need to yeah. put in a photo, right? Yeah, I think th th this photo is about equilibrium, you know, it's uh, cold and warm. Uh, shadow and light, uh, you know, moodiness and at the same time some some raw nature to it. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I believe this photo is about equilibrium. Uh, it's very well balanced. I believe this is a Dutch nature, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, maybe the windmill, no? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to uh, the second round of questions. Vraag ronde nummer 2. So, round of questions number two. Uh, first question is from Dick van Vliet, and he's asking, what aperture do you use the most? Yeah, so there's no um, recipe for apertures, like there's no gear you always use in a car. So um, I will use any range of apertures, so depending on the purpose, on the, 
uh, on the goal of my photo. So if I want to separate subject from background, of course, wide open, so 2.8, 4. If I want more depth of field, so I'll start using from f11 to 16 most of the times. Um, yeah, but there's no single aperture I use the most. So I just use the aperture that provides me the, the story, the visual story I want to achieve. Of course, yeah. Um, so we're going to the fifth question. It's from Henrik Jonas. Uh, how do you work during long journeys when we're talking about batteries and to make a backup of your photos? Uh, so um, sometimes I can find a power generator like petrol or solar, so I use it, but I can never trust. You know, Murphy's Law is very strong in photography and videography, so you have to be very careful. So I usually travel yeah. with 11 uh, packs of battery uh, and um, uh, yeah I have I have to do that because most of the times I don't have a, like a power outlet I can use and because I'm very um, concerned about losing what I shoot I will just bring portable hard drives so I have standalone hard drives that can read any kind of cards I use and they are SSDs yeah. so they can be dropped into the ground and not being uh, damaged so that's what I use mostly. So you always have a backup? Yeah, always. I triple backup. <laughs> always triple backup. <laughs> triple backup. And I also have yeah, two just servers. Just to make sure. <laughs> okay, next question. What is your favorite lens when you travel? And which do you use the most of the time? Uh, most of the time, prime or zoom lenses? Is from Annabelle de Groot. Okay, so uh, I have to travel light. So I tend to value more uh, zoom lenses than I do primes. But recently Canon released uh, the, the RF2870, which is for me a dream come true because it's the perfect mix between, you know, zoom and prime because it's a 2870 f2 constant. So I have like a 282, 35, 2, 52 and 70 f2. Uh, and so that's my all time favorite lenses uh, right now. That's the, for example, in the assignment I did in Niger, 95% uh, of all my shooting stills and video were done with that lens alone. Wow. Uh, I also heard you got the 7200 F4, uh, F4, right? Yes, for a long time I used the 7200 F4 until Canon also <laughs> created this new amazing lens, the RF 7200 2.8, which is very small, very lightweight. And I, I really need that because I need to be discreet, but also I need to be concerned about weight because of airlines and especially domestic airlines because you cannot travel with more than a certain weight. And that uh, lens yeah. allows me to have twice as much light. So it's a f2.8, so twice as much light. So it enables my creativity in a more uh, a powerful way, but weighting like half a kilogram less than the standard 7200 uh, 2.8, the old one, I mean. So, yeah, yeah. I never leave home with that, le that lens as well. <laughs> nice. Um, so, uh, next question is from Henny de Jong. Apart from photographing, I saw that you also make videos. Yeah, we talked about that already, right? Uh, which of the two do you like the most and why? Uh, although I do both, my passion is photography and will always be, you know, because uh, uh, photography is the root and because photography delivers the story in a way that I love. I can savor, I can, you know, look at a single frame for a lot of time and appreciate all the details in someone's skin, in a landscape and so on. And, and with video, you deliver the story to people. So the way you exercise the viewer's imagination is stronger in my perspective right. in a photo than it is in, in video. But that being said, I do love video because right now with the gear we have, with the lenses, with the, with the cameras we have, I can translate the aesthetics I have in photography into videography, which is really cool. And I'm having a blast also uh, shooting videos uh, as much as I can nowadays. Yeah, sometimes photographers say that uh, it's actually quite a different thing to video uh, to make a video. Yeah, but yeah. you don't you don't seem to have a problem with that. Yeah, uh, I, I'm I'm pretty multitasking. You know, sometimes I'm flying a drone, shooting three cameras: one with time lapse, one with video, one with stills, 
And, uh, you know, most people don't like that, but actually I love that challenge. I, I, I love to, you know, uh, be in the red line in my brain, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, and I love, I, I believe you can be a better photographer, being a better videographer, and also being uh, the other way around, you know, because you have to uh, achieve several levels of thought and concern differently, even the way you operate your camera. So, and I, I love that challenge actually. So yeah, I have fun doing that. Cool. Uh, we're going to the next round and that's what's in the back and you have to tell in one minute what's in your back. We gaan naar what's in the back. So, what's in the bag? You got one minute to show us what you got in your bag. Are you ready? Yeah, I am. So, in my Okay, here we go. So, I always use a black bag because I like to be discreet. And inside, I have the EOS R with the 2870 F2. Then I have the 1535 Stabilized 2.8. And the 7200 uh, 2.8, the RF lens. And also a Zoe Mini because I like to give prints to people and because I'm really paranoid about backing up my Gnar box, SSD. And also all sorts of other recording devices like this Zoom device and also my drone. And of course, lots of batteries. Wow, <laughs> you're really, really much on time. Okay, nice. Very good. Nice. So. That's a, that's a nice bag you have. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let's go further to uh, the, uh, the next round. It's the portfolio round number two. We gaan naar portfolio ronde nummer twee. Joël, portfolio round number two. And this time we got a video from Digital Travel Couple. And they say, we would like to get feedback on our newest travel film. The story is fiction. Shots, shots are being made in Myanmar during our journey in February. P.S. We bought all the gear we are shooting with at Camera Express. That's something we like to hear, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. That's nice. But um, yeah, what, did, what do you think about the video? So I really enjoyed the video. I think it's really well uh, filmed. The, they really took care with the light and the sound. So I really appreciate that in a video. Um, I love the locations. I've been myself in those uh, locations. So I believe they explored uh, those to the best of their extent. So that's really positive. Um, uh, although the audio is really, really good at some point, points I felt that the transition between the mood from one um, act of the story to the second act and to the third act, maybe sometimes uh, the transition is a little bit uh, abrupt, I believe, uh, but overall the audio is, is excellent. And also the script uh, for the, the story is, is good. It's a love story. So it's about uh, two people trying to be together again. And because there's a lot of build up, there's, so the video is about nine minutes long. There's a seven and a half minute uh, build up to this kind of climax where they meet. And so uh, I just, it's just my opinion. The climax in a way I was expecting it to be stronger. I mean, when the time they finally okay. meet and they should uh, hug, you know, I'm a Latin guy, so I'm a hugging guy. We, we are very, <laughs> you know, warm and uh, so uh, maybe because... You wanted it a bit more Im uh, intimate. Yes, yes. More intense. Yeah, more intense. Maybe because I'm that kind of person, uh, I was maybe somehow expecting it to be a little bit, you know, wah, uh, strong because you have a really big build up. Um, so, but all in all, uh, I really, uh, uh, I think the, the angles are very well thought, the way, you know, the dynamics, the rotation of the camera is well explored, 
together with more you know set pieces uh, in other places so yeah uh, congratulations for the video I'm really looking forward to the next ones and I believe uh, using camera express gear helps a lot no <laughs> Yeah, it sure yeah, does. <laughs> yeah, but but the, the the true talent lies behind the camera. So, uh, congratulations to both of them. It's really really nice. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to the round of questions number three. Vragen ronde number three. So, Joël, round of questions number three. Uh, the first question is from Clara Smith. Uh, what are the destinations you still like to travel to? <laughs> I would love to go to Mars if the Tesla guy uh, um, uh, <laughs> releases the rocket to do it. But of course, here on Earth, I would love to visit, um, you know, every country that I didn't uh, visit until today. And there's a lot still to do. And of course, I would love to go again to many countries I've already been because I love to, you know, go deeper and deeper, uh, finding different layers to the stories. So yeah, to sum up, uh, everywhere in the world. But if I had to pick one right now, I would pick New Zealand because it's a perfect antipode of Portugal. So if I dig a hole uh, on the ground on the other side, I would end up uh, in Nelson, so in New Zealand. And because of this COVID situation and the lockdown, and etc., I would love to go as far away as I could uh, and experience some beautiful nature that I'm sure uh, I would find in New Zealand. Oh, I'm absolutely sure about that. Yeah. Um, next question. What are your favorite destinations to travel to? And do you have a good travel advice for people who don't have a fat wallet? From Michael Schippers. Okay, so um, so my, my favorite destinations would be almost anywhere in the world that is remote, uh, where I could find, um, you know, tribes or active volcanoes. So that would be my prime uh, destinations. Uh, and regarding the money you need to travel, of course, you need uh, money to do it. But like everything else in life is a trade-off. So you don't go for buying an expensive car, you save. I uh, don't go to uh, restaurants every day, uh, so you save, and that's what I do. So I try to save money to the stuff I love to do, and step by step, uh, you end up with the money uh, you need to go almost anywhere in the world, right? actually. So my advice would be, if you really love what you do, if you really want to be uh, the better, the best you can in this field, so yeah, you have to make choices, especially if you're not rich, of course, uh, then you have to make choices. But in the end, it's possible. Everything is possible. I believe that. Yeah, exactly. We just have to save a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> if we can. Uh, number 10. Are you ever afraid while you travel? And do you travel alone or with somebody? Bo van Dijk. Uh, you know, uh, I can be more afraid of crossing a very high bridge than I am on the verge of a volcano or among really? people, yeah, or, or among people holding Kalashnikovs, you know, I'm very calm in those situations, so I, I'm not afraid at all. Actually, uh, somehow I enjoy it uh, uh, when the stuff gets a little bit rough. Uh, but in, in a nice way, I don't want anybody to be suffering or something like that. I'm just saying that usually I'm not afraid of those uh, uh, situations. Wow. Tough guy. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Actually, I'm very um, thoughtful guy. Uh, I, I try to balance all the risks all the time, but I'm a risk taker. Yes, I'm, uh, I would see it that way, uh, because sometimes when you want something, you have to take risks. Uh, and you, you cannot postpone it until you, you are 90. <laughs> so we have to do it when you were there. You have to do it now. Yeah, I have to do it now. When you're fit enough to do it. Uh, number 11, which languages do you speak? And are there uh, any languages you'd like to learn for a specific journey? From Marike Meijer. Yeah, so I speak Portuguese, that's my native language. Uh, and also I, I am very fluent in Spanish because it's like a neighbor language to Portuguese. I can speak English like, <laughs> like I'm speaking right now. 
also I can speak I like French, it. although it's a bit uh, rusty. And with these four languages, actually, I'm able to travel almost all over the world because they are among the six most spoken languages uh, in the world. Um, but I would also love to learn a little bit more of Mandarin. Uh, I know like about 100 words, but it not... could be handy, right? Yeah, that yeah. could be handy. Uh, and also, uh, in the past, I could also speak a little bit of Bahasa Indonesia, but since 2007, I don't do it daily, so I'm starting to lose uh, my vocabulary. And, uh, and is there any language you'd like to learn for a specific journey? Yeah, maybe a Mandarin. Mandarin would be nice yeah. because there's a lot, you know, China is a huge country. Uh, I've been to China maybe 12 times uh, and I, I believe I've just seen a drop of that country. So why not? Cool. Uh, we're going to portfolio round number three. We're going to portfolio round number three. So portfolio round number three, and this time we got two photos. And the first one is from Michiel van den Bos. It's a portrait, a Bali portrait 2020 is the description. Okay, so about this photo, uh, I really love portraits and I love this kind of framing, so tight framing and also black and white. Um, but what I would say about this photo is that if the protagonist is the man, um, so his face is the one of the darkest regions in the photo. So if you look at the photo, the hat and also the, um, the, the label, my trip, it really draws the attention uh, when you look at the portrait. So I believe that the hat being so bright and also the label, uh, somehow they detract your attention from, from the, you know, the eyes and the expression uh, of the band. So, uh, although I really love this portrait, uh, if I would uh, like to be really picky about, uh, you know, uh, this kind of details in, in a photo, if it was my portrait, I would be, you know, very um, concerned about, about these two uh, aspects. Otherwise, I love the way, you know, there's a very beautiful background separation from the subject. Uh, and also, I believe that when you shoot a portrait, you need to uh, think about what kind of message you want to convey to people that uh, look at your photo. So exactly, is your photo yeah. about uh, a farmer or is uh, your photo about a farmer who has been influenced by Western uh, culture? Because this My Trip, My Adventure is a TV show that uh, ran in Indonesia and uh, it still does, I believe. So what kind of message are you trying to okay. convey? So don't have the portrait so you have just another portrait try to find what kind of story are you trying to tell with this portrait so i don't know what's the intention behind the, this photo right so this would be my main comments to this photo but otherwise congratulations it's a beautiful photo nice thank you so much for your feedback we're going to uh the second photo it's from costas Ranassos. I'm not sure whether I pronounce it uh, right. It's a, a very nice, uh, brightful picture, right? Yeah, so this photo from Costas is a be very beautiful landscape. I love symmetry, so uh, the reflection plays a big role in this photo. Also, the warm tones and hues are very beautiful in, in, in the photo. Uh, the kind of, uh, you know, the calm that this photo conveys to you is uh, very, very nice. So I would say that um, exposure-wise, composition-wise, uh, if you're uh, trying to evaluate a picture just for the landscape side of it, it's, I believe it's a very um, technically and not only that very uh, strong image. So I really like it as well. Thank you. Thank you again for your feedback. We're going to the next round. It's the pro tip from Joël. The pro tip from Joël. So, Joël, your pro tip for our viewers. Okay, so uh, my pro tip would be more inspirational. I believe that you should do what you do with passion all the times. Uh, I think that should be your main driving force, not uh, what you can accomplish uh, on social media and what, what you can accomplish 
uh, on a financial side, but first of all, your passion. Because if you're really passionate about what you're doing, I'm sure you'll be the best uh, photographer or videographer you could ever be uh, in your life. And that thing, I believe, will come through your images, uh, through your work. I believe that will touch other people's lives uh, and also your future clients. Uh, so I believe passion is uh, the key. If you're doing it for any other reason, um, I believe you're not having the proper fuel uh, to, you know, to become the best photographer and videographer that you're dreaming t uh, to be. Yes, you really have to uh, love what you do, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure, because uh, uh, don't, don't get fooled. Uh, doing this is not easy. Most people uh, see our jobs as kind of a dream job because uh, they see people traveling and experiencing and uh, you have to make sure uh, you have to keep in mind I, I mean that um, it takes a really big toll on your personal life uh, financially physically uh, you have to sometimes uh, uh, you, you don't eat properly for several weeks you don't sleep properly uh, you get injured uh, there's a lot of stuff that can happen and the only way you can cope with that is with passion, because passion, passion is not a rational thing. It's just something that burns inside your chest. And that kind of energy is really necessary to, to fuel everything that you must do, that you want to do. So, and there's no shortcuts ever. There's no shortcuts. You have to walk the walk, you know? Uh, so if you, yeah. if you feel willing to do that, I'm, sure that you'll be most definitely uh, successful at whatever you do in life either it's photography or just uh, you know gardening <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much for your lovely tip um what are you busy with at the moment are there any projects projects running or something yeah so i'm actually pretty busy at the moment i'm shooting uh, uh i have uh, we have created this series of documentaries for tv uh, four years ago and we are about to start season number four but because of the COVID situation it can long, no longer be uh, you know in foreign countries so actually I'm shooting uh, a lot in Portugal we are creating five episodes in different regions of Portugal and that's what's going to be premiered uh, uh, this July and August so um, I'm actually uh, five minutes late to start doing that, uh, and so. But this is good. Uh, uh, time pressure is good for for this kind of uh, uh, job, and uh, mostly shooting uh, video, not only terrestrial but aerial as well, and lots and lots of interviews uh, with uh, actors, with farmers, with all kinds of jobs. So we're trying to get a perspective on how COVID affected their lives how they are coping with it and at the same time show Portugal as a beautiful country it is and spark you know again the willingness to travel inside our own country and also attract again people uh, to Portugal when it's safe enough because uh, we are very dependent on tourism uh, and again as a photographer and as a journalist I believe that my task is also to contribute um, somehow to someone and this is just a small brick uh, that I'm trying to put in this big wall uh, that everybody does uh, as a whole so uh, uh, we are trying to contribute this way with documentaries inspirational but at the same time with uh, really good information nice i wish you uh, a lot of luck with everything you're going to do thank you so much uh, i thank also so want to learning. thank you very much for being here with us and uh, tell your story to tell your story so uh, thank you so much joel thank you so much Willemaine, and to all of you guys it's been really really a pleasure so um, i hope we can meet again soon and also thank you very much yeah, to all the people you. you know commenting and sending the photos for review thank you so much Nice. And if you, if people want to check your website, it's Joel Santos, no? Yes, my website is joelsantos.net. So welcome to visit it. And also I'm on Instagram and on Facebook. So it's Joel Santos photo with PH. Uh, so let's meet there. Check it out. Yeah. <laughs>
Check it out. Thank you so much. Goodbye, Joel. So well. Bye bye. Have a nice bye -bye. day. See, see you next time. Bye bye. 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 En jij natuurlijk ook hartstikke bedankt voor het kijken. We hopen dat je er wat van op hebt gestoken. Volgende week is er natuurlijk weer een nieuwe Meet the Pro. En deze keer gaan we spreken met bruidsfotograaf Ashwin Gishawan. Hij komt bij ons in de studio. We hopen natuurlijk dat je er dan ook weer bij bent. Heb jij vragen of wil je je portfolio ook delen met een van onze nieuwe pros? Ga dan even naar onze Facebookpagina en kijk naar de post van Meet the Pro. Daaronder in de comment kun je daarbij je vragen en je portfolio delen. Hartstikke bedankt voor het kijken nogmaals en graag tot de volgende.